Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football is brought to you by your local Anheuser-Busch distributors, O'Brien Auto Park of Urbana, Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana, and WAND. Welcome to Inside the Illini Big Ten Football, a week after probably the most competitive game we've seen by the Fighting Illini in the Big Ten in quite a while. Hi, I'm Matt Loveless, host of Inside the Illini, here to guide you through the next hour of coverage. We'll talk about that Penn State game in depth. In fact, in the next segment, plus we'll get to some Big Ten topics and take a hard look at Indiana, which is Illinois' next opponent. They play them at 2.30, and of course, I'm joined by the panel of experts. Matt Daniels of the Champagne News Gazette, Steve Kelly, Sports Talk 1400. And, um, of course, Matt, you're always here. I'm always here with a big load of papers <laughs> on my desk. You show up with nothing because it's all in the mind. Oh, I try. That's, uh, <laughs> that, that's what they pay me to do at the News Gazette is just have all this information stored up inside. So that's what I try to do. The encyclopedia. <laughs> well, well, Steve, let's uh, talk to you first about this, this game last Saturday. Defense showed up to play in the second half. So some, there were a lot of positives, more so than... We've had pretty much since I've been here. Yeah, and I don't know that you saw the uh, defense showing up to play in the second half coming because right. of what happened the week before when they just totally disappeared in the uh, second half. So it was encouraging on that point. The discouraging part was getting the ball in the end zone when you got in the red zone. They had trouble doing that again, but they were in the game. It went to overtime, had a really good opportunity to get by them to win a game on the road. No, it's not your big brother's Penn State. I get that, but still, it was a road game, a, a good crowd. It would have been a, a nice win. Matt, was this more encouraging that it was close, or was it just another discouraging loss, do you think? I think it's more encouraging. I know fans are obviously unhappy with the losses as they keep mm -hmm. piling up, and, and especially with the opportunities Illinois had Saturday. I mean, they had the ball. Uh, Penn State didn't have any timeouts. It was about three minutes to go, and they, they couldn't get a first down. They get a first down there late in the fourth quarter. We're probably talking about a 4-4 four and four Illinois team instead of, you know, a three and five Illinois team that's on an 18 game Big Ten losing streak going into today's game at Indiana. Um, but the, I think the encouraging part was just the, the defense. Uh, Penn State was able to move the ball at will uh, early in the game. Christian Hackenberg was, wasn't looking like a true freshman. Alan Robinson, he'll play on Sundays uh, in the very near future. And Bill Belton looked like the, the second coming of Larry Johnson Jr., Franco Harris at Penn State. And uh, the defense made stops when they had to. Uh, they had that bend but don't break mentality, and, and more times than not, especially in the second half, they, they didn't break at all. You mentioned uh, the defense struggling in the first half. You know, a couple weeks ago, they're giving up 14 to 16 on uh, on third down. They started that way four or five, giving that up, and uh, Penn State got the fourth down on the one that they didn't get the third down. So, what did you see that was different in the second? Well, I suppose the the encouraging part is the fact they they got down early Three. by a couple of touchdowns and. Sure. And hung in there. You didn't really feel so bad at 14 to three, right. although it could have been, and probably should have been, a little <laughs> closer at halftime. Um, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what was different, other than they didn't give up. Yeah, and at that point, I mean, it was 14 to nothing. Then it was 14 to three at halftime. For the most part, uh, they seemed like they were dominated in all phases of the game. But what a second half we saw. We'll break it down next on Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. Welcome back to Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. It was an intriguing matchup last week. Uh, another really a down season for Illinois in the Big Ten so far and a distinctively up and down season in Happy Valley for Penn State. But in the end, throw all the matchups out the window as we got a thriller in Happy Valley. According to some accounts, State College Pennsylvania is nicknamed Happy Valley because it avoided many effects of the Great Depression. Unfortunately, that moniker doesn't really apply to visiting college football teams. Illinois on the Penn State campus, Beaver Stadium, and things weren't so happy from the start. Penn State's Bill Belton avoiding one tackle, absorbing another as the Nittany Lions went up 7-0 in the first. In the second, Nittany Lion freshman QB Christian Hackenberg calling his own number, a gutsy dive to the goal line. They'd look at this again, but Hackenberg did cross the plane Penn State went up 14-0. A late field goal for Illinois made it 14-3 at the half, but the deficit felt much larger. But a pleasant surprise coming out of the locker room. Illinois' defense started getting stops. The offense started finding the end zone. 
third quarter, Nate Shieldhouse with the backward pass to Josh Ferguson. That would count as eight rushing yards and six points. Illinois pulled within four, and a rare opportunity followed. Illinois with the ball and the chance to go ahead. A beautiful drive ensued. Shieldhouse hooking up with Steve Hull, caught at the Penn State 14. And just a few plays later, pocket collapsing on the play action, but dumping off a screen to Ferguson, who sees a leaping point and springs into the end zone. Touchdown, Illinois, a 17-14 lead in hostile territory. But time left for Penn State to try and win it in regulation. Hackenberg looking to the end zone, but Darius Mosley with the game-saving pass breakup. Penn State would settle for the field goal, and we'd go to overtime. In the extra period, Penn State with the ball first and on the board first. Hackenberg to Kyle Carter, touchdown Nittany Lions. The pressure squarely on Illinois' side once again. On the first play of Illinois' possession, Shieldhouse tossing into double coverage and a teamwork interception by the Penn State secondary. Game over. Illinois fell 24-17 in their grittiest contest in a long time. You know, I, I was just thinking about it that night, and uh, it was one of those games you just wanted to keep going because you, you just felt like, uh, you know, you really were having your way with them uh, for the majority of the game. I mean, we had two three and outs there. I hate losing, but I mean, it was it was definitely something we could build on. Well, guys, I think uh, my takeaway from the game, the big play was the fumble deep in their own territory or deep in Illinois' territory. They got the ball back, they had the lead and the ball a situation Illinois hasn't seen very often, and maybe we saw that they don't quite know how to put a game away at that point quite yet. Yeah, I mean, Tim Beckman uh, had a lot of questions asked about that particular sequence on mm -hmm. Monday during his weekly press conference, and, and rightfully so. I mean, uh, you run the ball three times there, you bleed the clock out some more. They went with a play-action pass to uh, Evan Wilson, the big tight end, and then the pass was overthrown, so second down and then two straight uh, one-yard runs that forced him to punt again and, and gave Penn State the ball back. And the Nittany Lions capitalized, but I know Bill Cubitt, Illinois' offensive coordinator, didn't feel particularly confident in, in the run game and, and hasn't really felt that way in the last uh, three Big Ten games. So uh, we'll see if that, that uh, he feels more confident in the run game today against a, a very poor Indiana defense at all. Do you think that was a decider in the game, that clock management there in the end of the game? I think it was a, a key factor in the game. I don't know if it was the lone decider or not, but that was uh, certainly a key factor. And I agree with Matt. They've not had any success running the ball. <laughs> Donovan Young at least showed up in this game and was a little bit better than he, he had been. existed in this game. Yeah, <laughs> he, he actually got the ball tucked into, <laughs> into his belly and gained a yard or two. But uh, so yeah, that was that was a key point in the game. Uh, third quarter, I, I noticed we talked you know at length about the third quarter issues. They won third quarter this time. They came out of the locker room with a little bit of intensity on both sides of the ball and were pretty effective. Yeah, Tim Beckman mentioned after the game, too, uh, that, that halftime was a little bit more uh, more intense maybe than usual. Guys kind of spoke up and, and kind of took ownership of some things. And, um, you know, they, they had opportunities in the first half, too. I mean, they had a touchdown called back on a, a penalty for the second straight right. week. Uh, poor clock management we talk about at the end of the game, but also at the end of the first half where they shouldn't have come away with a field goal. They should have had a touchdown there uh, late in the second quarter. So um, second half, though, they, they came out and played inspired. And, and the, like I said earlier, the real encouraging thing was the defense and just uh, Penn State tested them uh, and Illinois responded. Bill Belton uh, rushed for a couple hundred yards. <laughs> uh, it, Playing the Illinois defense is becoming a Big Ten running back's dream so far this season. No doubt. He's the latest guy to go over <laughs> 200 yards, and he was really good. And, uh, you know, back to the defense and the third quarter, we really didn't see that coming because I think the, the stat was Illinois had been outscored 41-7 to in the third quarter mm -hmm. in, in the, the Big Ten so far. So you didn't anticipate it getting much better, but the, they came out and hung in there and really had a chance to win the game. I, in, in that last drive to – the go-ahead score in the end there was real impressive. And, of course, you love seeing Josh Ferguson give up his body for that last touchdown. You can tell how badly they want it to go ahead in the game. Oh, yeah, no, they they, uh, they like getting the ball to Josh Ferguson in mm -hmm. space and, and letting him use his athleticism, and that was key in their two touchdowns. Uh, the first one was actually similar a, looking plays. Sim kind of similar looking plays. The first one was actually a, an eight-yard run by Josh Ferguson right. for a touchdown because Nathan Shields threw a lateral, and, and Ferguson capitalized on that. And, and Ferguson had a, a solid game uh, catching the ball and, and running with it, but the, the running game still in between the tackles is not, uh, not a strong suit for Illinois at all. What do they need to do to get that running game going? 
It's a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> you looked at me with that. Tell, tell Coach Cubitt. Yeah, you all know. the games that I've coached all, over the years, I, I don't know. You need to get better offensive linemen for one thing. I mean, that's a that's not a this week thing. That's maybe a next year thing. But you, you got to start there. And, well, and in fairness to the way that the offense is schemed up, Josh Ferguson does get a lot of these yeah. passes that are runs, just yeah. the way that the, the play is set up, the blocking is set up. They go down as receiving yards. He had 73 more yards, up over 400 for the season. Meanwhile, Nate threw the ball quite a bit, 52 times. Yeah, I bet his arm was pretty sore on yeah. Sunday. Um, a lot of that, too, and, and Tim Beckman and Bill Cubitt both addressed it this week, is just they, they fell behind early and they had to play catch up. And, and they obviously feel more confident in, in the passing game right now. Yeah, I think so. And he's looked pretty good. He's up to second total yardage in Illinois history. A lot, of, a lot of room to catch up to Juice, though. <laughs> uh, well, the 12 Big Ten games on the schedule last week, all 12 teams playing each other, some impactful ones. We'll talk about the leaders division next on Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. The Inside the Illini Weekly MVP recognizes the top Illinois player from the last Fighting Illini game. And if Josh Ferguson was the closer last week, Spencer Harris provided some valuable long relief. To go with a career-high 10 catches, we look closer into Harris's numbers. Four of those grabs came on Illinois' first touchdown drive, including a big first down reception on third and long. Harris ended with 81 yards to earn honors as our weekly MVP. Hi, welcome back to Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. We're here at Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana. Now, the first half of the Ohio State-Purdue game was probably of little surprise to people who have seen both of those teams play, but the halftime score of the Wisconsin-Iowa game might have been of some concern to folks up there in Madison. Our own Eric Harold lends his voice to the highlights from last week. Thank you, Matt. Purdue in the leaders division gets the unenviable task of trying to take out number four, Ohio State. Danny Etling drops back, rolls right, and finds the wrong color jersey as Duran Grant picks off Danny Etling, touchdown Ohio State less than a minute into the game. They're up seven. Later, Braxton Miller looks right, then comes back left to Jeff Hireman, wide open along the sideline. He rumbles into the end zone. Ohio State up 14-0. They had no problems with the Boilermakers. They win 56 to nothing. Number 24, Wisconsin on the road against the Iowa Hawkeyes. Joel Stave drops back, looks down the middle of the field for Jared Abraderis. Wide open in the end zone, touchdown Wisconsin, puts him up 14-6, and they take out Iowa 28-9. And it's another week, another Indiana shootout, this time against Minnesota. Trey Roberson throws a left side, touchdown to Kofi Hughes, 10-7 Indiana, they lead. This one would come down to the closing minutes. Philip Nelson throws to Max Williams, and his big tight end rumbles into the end zone, puts them up 42-39, and that would be your final as Minnesota survives against Indiana. And taking a look at the leaders' division standings, Ohio State remains at the top, completely undefeated, and Illinois and Purdue still winless in the Big Ten round out the bottom of the standings. Now we return to the Inside the Illini crew. Guys, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but we get to see Ohio State beat the snot out of Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> then they get a week of rest, and then they come to Champaign. Uh, Buckeyes are just absolutely clicking right now. Oh, yeah, Urban Meyer's got that thing rolling. Uh, he probably could be voted governor of Ohio right now with the, <laughs> the way they're going. And, uh, yeah, they, they get a rest today and watch Illinois probably put up a bunch of points and watch Illinois' defense probably give up a bunch of points at Indiana and, and game plan for uh, for their trip to uh, Champaign next well, weekend. They could do a little multi-scouting because they have to play both these teams yet, uh, the Illini and the Hoosiers, right. Ohio State does. So uh, I guess the question would be how many points did they put up <laughs> total <laughs> against those two teams. I don't know. I, I imagine both of the teams, though, they'll expect a bigger fight than they got against, uh, they got from Purdue. As you said, it was 35 nothing early in the second That's quarter right. of that game. So yeah. uh, and we'll move on to a game that was a bit more competitive, Wisconsin-Iowa, talking about the Badgers, only up 7-6 to six at the half. I don't know if you guys, you were covering the game, but tracking that game, a little concern, what's happening? Yeah, I think uh, there might be a little concern, but Wisconsin, you know, uh, ultimately prevailed in, in the right. second half, and, and their running game is still strong. And I'd still say uh, behind Ohio State, um, I mean, Michigan State's making a case as well, but, you know, Wisconsin and Michigan State are almost kind of 2A and 2B behind Ohio State right now in the Big Ten. Right. It seems like James White took over, 19 carries, 132 yards, when Melvin Gordon wasn't having his 
his best day, but that running game is, is just, just never goes away. Yeah, it was a close game, as you mentioned, at halftime, and probably a little closer than the final score of 20, what was it, 20, 28 to 9. 29 to 6, or 28 to 9, yes. Um, but uh, yeah, Wisconsin just put it away in the second half. Well, Wisconsin hosts BYU next. They go out of conference for a week. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about Penn State. We just saw, uh, just got to see him play almost bowl eligible. Of course, they're not going to a bowl game because of the sanctions, but still finding ways to win, albeit, you know, down three in your home turf. And the other team has the ball. They found a way to win. Yeah, I mean, uh, Christian Hackenberg does not look like a true freshman at all. If he stays all four years, he's got a chance to rewrite all the uh, passing records at right. Penn State. And he's the, the quarterback that, you know, Bill Ryan wants to operate his offense. Uh, Allen Robinson is a stud. Um, I'd say on his highlight tape, a lot of his plays that he made against Illinois will show up on it. I know he had a big game early, early in the year against right. Michigan as well. And, and Bill Belton just kind of, he'd shown flashes of it, but then uh, against <laughs> Illinois' run defense, he just kind of emerged and, and became that feature back that, that Penn State's been looking for all year. And uh, last, we'll talk about Indiana here since uh, we'll get way more in depth on them a little bit later. But Steve, uh, fall to Minnesota, they were down by a ton in that game, came back but ultimately couldn't put it away. That defense just can't seem to hold anybody. No, they can't. They had uh, some turnovers late that, that cost them. They're, they're putting up a bunch of points, as uh, you would guess. You talked about the, uh, the over-under on the Illinois game at over 76 points or whatever it is. And, uh, Take the over. It's <laughs> <laughs> one probably, of the highest of the weekend. I think Fresno State, Wyoming might be the only one that's That high. might not be a bad strategy to take the over. Depends on the weather, perhaps. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, 35 to 13, they were down. Ended up giving 42 points. Uh, we'll talk about it later, like I said. But they've given up more than 40 points in five games this season, all five of those losses. So I guess Illinois score 40. And then uh, Purdue. Purdue's the first Big Ten to <laughs> team to officially be eliminated from bowl contention. I think that was a foregone conclusion after week one. Yeah, I think folks in West Lafayette are probably uh, not happy that Danny Hope uh, is no longer on the sidelines. Yeah. And Daryl Hazel's definitely got an uphill climb right now. All right, well, uh, next up we'll talk about the legends. Michigan State, Michigan, Nebraska, all competing for the division, all playing each other over the course of three weeks. One of those big matchups happened last week. We'll talk about it next on Inside the Illini, Big Ten Football. The Inside the Illini Play of the Week is sponsored by your local Anheuser-Busch distributor, Gagne Distributor. The biggest play of the game, down by four in hostile territory, the Illini put together a drive, and you could just see the determination in the run after catch for Josh Ferguson. Ferguson leaping over the pile, coming out clean on the other end. A touchdown that gave Illinois a fourth quarter lead. And welcome back to Inside the Illini. We're talking leaders division now in the Big Ten. A statement by the Spartans. The Huskers hang on, and the Gophers just won't go away. We go back to our own Eric Harold for the highlights. Thank you, Matt. Legends Division, number 22, Michigan State taking on number 21, Michigan. Second quarter, Cotter Cook looks right to Benny Fowler, corner of the end zone, makes the catch, gets a feed in, 13-6 Michigan State. Later, Michigan State still rolling. Jeremy Langford takes it around the left side, jukes a defender, and gets into the end zone, puts Michigan State up 29-6, and they would win over Michigan. That's your final. Nebraska taking on Northwestern, and Northwestern's Trayvon Green would have himself a day. Over 100 yards of ground, 39 of them here. This one set up a four-yard touchdown run as he takes the pitch from Coulter. Touchdown Green, three touchdowns on the day for him. This thing would come down to the very last play. Time expiring, Ron Kellogg heaves it to the end zone. Hail Mary deflected to Jordan Westerkamp. Nebraska wins improbably. On the final play of the game, Nebraska wins 27-24 over the Wildcats. Iowa taking on number 24, Wisconsin. Pick it up in the second quarter as Joel Stave in the shotgun. Drops back, looks down the middle of the field, looking for Jacob Pedersen. His big tight end makes the catch into the end zone. Wisconsin takes a one-point lead, and they would take out Iowa 28-9. Indiana taking on Minnesota, and when you know it, Indiana got into another shootout. This one went late into the fourth quarter. Minnesota down four. That changes here as Philip Nelson gets it to Max Williams. He runs it the rest of the way. 42-39 Minnesota. Minnesota survives against Indiana. And so after last week's action, Michigan State 
remains unchallenged at the top of the Legends division, undefeated in the Big Ten, and now we return to the Inside the Illini crew. Thank you, Eric, and we'll start with the uh, the big game last week, the two ranked opponents, Michigan State and Michigan. Michigan State now 8-1, 5-0 in the Big Ten. Um, a 29-6 one, a pretty good statement for a, a Michigan team that had just scored 63 points. They don't get in the end zone. Yeah, Michigan State's defense is, uh, you know, stepped up once again and, and proven they're uh, the elite defense in the country right now. Uh, I'd say it'd be a heck of a Big Ten championship game just with contrasting styles if it, if it works out with Ohio State facing Michigan State. And uh, Michigan State, you know, showed that uh, they're not the little sister to, uh, to Michigan anymore. And they... They definitely uh, and they, haven't been and for haven't been years. for a while, and they they made some uh, some folks in Ann Arbor probably not too happy with Brady Hoke this week. I'd say. Yeah, I think so. I'm not surprised that Michigan State won the game. I, I was a little bit surprised not seeing the game, but but when I saw the uh, score, I was watching scores as the, as it went along. I didn't think they'd beat them 29 to six, but they got in the backfield quite a bit, didn't they? Yes, absolutely, they did. Uh, and the key stat from that game: negative 48 yards rushing for Michigan State. It's a negative 48 yards rushing total, and that's a product of getting in the backfield a lot. All right, moving on, uh, Nebraska moving to 6-2, and two, beating Northwestern on a Hail Mary that works. Yeah, Quite they, a game you, there. you don't see that very often, and that might have been painful for some Illinois fans to see at the end because uh, Jordan Westerkamp, the receiver that caught it, was a, a stud at Montini High School up yeah. in Lombard and, and had huge games here at Memorial Stadium uh, in the state championship games, and his dad played at Illinois. and. He kind of came down with that, that miracle heave from uh, Ron Kellogg. And um, yeah, Nebraska, you know, kind of saved Bo Pelini's, Bo Pelini's uh, season probably with that win and, and his, his time in, in Lincoln as well. They became bowl eligible, but I think that was pretty much expected from the beginning in Lincoln. That wasn't the only goal for this I, team. I think so. And watching the highlight of that over and over again, <laughs> you couldn't not watch it, I guess. But uh, the most shocked guy there was Bo Pelini, I think. He was like, what just happened? Yeah. I think he'd already had it in his mind that. Uh, they lost that game, and he, his seat really was going to get hot, and then all of a sudden they pull it out. I think if you're the defensive coordinator for Northwestern, you wonder how that ball was in the air for as long <laughs> as it was. Uh, the N Nebraska outgained Northwestern by about 150 yards, but lost their turnover battle 4-1 to one and still pulled out. And how it gets tipped into the <laughs> yeah. end zone instead of the other one. Right, exactly. Not, not well defended. Northwestern, meanwhile, moves to 4-5. and five. Now we start looking at the next three games in their schedule. Uh, what did we see? They have a bye week. They go to Michigan. They play Michigan State. Do you, I don't know if they have two wins out of those three. Yeah, I wouldn't say so. The uh, the good feelings they have in Evanston are, are long gone by now. And uh, yeah, Pat Fitzgerald's team is definitely on a, a slide right now. Mm -hmm. That's kind of unmatched in the Big Ten outside of what Illinois is going through. So the uh, the state of the two Big Ten programs in Illinois right now is uh, not on a high note at all. A team that deserves some discussion is Minnesota. So Steve, what, what have you seen? Seven and two now. Yeah, they're just, they just kind of get it done, don't they? They're not really spectacular. Uh, they're able to run the ball, which is big in this conference. Defense is okay, but uh, I, was, I was impressed with they, the way they went to Indiana. Had that big lead, they, they had to hang on to win, but uh, they put that game away and then uh, had to re-win it, so to speak. But uh, I've been impressed with them. Uh, a three-game winning streak, and Jerry Kill still sitting in the booth there, so they've rallied even without that. You may want to stay up there. <laughs> <laughs> you might think he's a good luck charm in the booth. <laughs> hey, up next, uh, our Inside the Illini Spotlight, a great opportunity to get to know some of our Illini a little bit better. A widening role for a veteran wide receiver. We'll talk to senior Spencer Harris about he's adjusting to his growing part in this offense. That's next on Inside the Illini, Big Ten Football. Back to Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. Back here in time for the Inside the Illini Spotlight. We get to know our players a little bit more. Now, this guy's contributions have been growing throughout the season. But after news that senior receiver and really the emotional leader of that receiving core, Ryan Langford, was out for the season, Spencer Harris's role has suddenly grown by quite a bit. Ten catches last week. Our spotlight turns to Harris as he talks to our Noah Newman and our Inside the Illini Spotlight. Spencer Harris has saved his best season for last. Through six games, he already has seven more catches than last year. 
Last weekend in Happy Valley, he had a career-high 10 catches for 81 yards. When we needed to make a play, Spencer Harris made the play. But it's the final play that stuck with him the most. You know, I take full blame for not making the play at the end of the game, uh, either, you know, knocking it away or catching it. And, uh, you know, that, that, that does take, a, you know, demoralize you a little bit. Despite the end result, the senior from Arkansas feels better about this team than he did two weeks ago. Yeah, I think the confidence of the offense is uh, is rolling well. You know, there we had a kind of slouch against Michigan State, which, you know, they're unbelievable defense, all props to them. Uh, but I think that, you know, Nathan, Nathan has a confidence level that's all over the roof. With just four games left, Harris and his fellow receivers are playing for more than just themselves. They're playing for Ryan Langford, whose season was cut short with a shoulder injury. You know, we, we got to replace Ron Lakeford. Uh, you know, that kid uh, did a great job, and you know, it, and it sucked. It really does suck to see him see him uh, in a career like that. There's one of your best friends that doesn't get to play the game anymore. Uh, how are you going to respond? And I think that those three seniors uh, played a lot of that football game, not just for this Illini football team, but also for Ryan Lankford. Harrison Company will try to win one for Ryan today in Bloomington, where their last Big Ten victory came two years ago. A great opportunity this week. You know, I think we're going to go in, you know, fire and, and work our butts off this week, and uh, I think we have a great chance. Thank you, Noah. And this guy, you know, he's been a quiet part of the offense. I, I looked up his career averages. I mean, an average game over the course of his career, which is a, a long career, two catches, 21 yards. <laughs> he's just kind of there. Uh, up until last week, 10 catches, 81 yards. Uh, Spencer, I think, growing confidence here in the final few games. Of this oh, and he has to with, with Langford being out. Mm -hmm. uh, he's had to kind of fill that void, and uh, we, we joke about it sometimes in the press box when Spencer Harris catches the ball. It's almost like breaking news because sometimes he's the forgotten man, but he's uh, he seemed to embrace the, the new role uh, that I always asked of him, and he's a dependable option for, for Nathan Chilas, and it showed last week at Penn State. Well, you can see it was clicking between those two because, mm -hmm. he hit, as you said, he hit him ten times and uh, got good yardage out of it. And uh, so they were on the same page, and uh, Steve Hole uh, stepped up again as well. And, and Miles O'Say, so three senior receivers played pretty well. Yeah, and, and those guys, you know, they're kind of in the twilights of probably their football careers, not just their college careers. So really stepping up in the last three weeks, uh, Spencer has 20 catches for 182 yards and a touchdown. Uh, 13 more yards, he matches his career high that he set last year. He'll probably get that today with the way these offenses play. Yeah, I would assume so. And, uh, you know, Spencer Harris is, uh, came here from Arkansas, the lone Arkansas native on the Illinois football team. He's got quite the impressive beard going right yes, now. Yes, he does. Uh, it's, uh, he's going to grow it out. He, he it's told very me biblical. It is. He, he told me he's going to grow it out through the rest of the season. It's he, When he shaves it off, he's afraid he's going to look like a 14-year-old kid. But uh, right now, he, he's got the beard going and the long hair and in full effect. <laughs> I'm trying to match him, but it's not working right now. It's, it's a good beard for TV. I'll tell you what, we, we put him on camera this week during the news. You, you need a wider shot to put the whole beard in there. Uh, no, he, he's been pretty impressive lately. And, you know, Four of those catches he had last week were on that first touchdown drive. One of them was on the third and, third and long. And so he's been plugged in in some of those important situations, and uh, he's come through. Well, speaking of spotlight, the Bears sure enjoyed it on Monday night. They probably enjoyed the win at Lambeau Field a little bit more as we get ready for the full Week 10 NFL schedule. We turn to our own Elise Mediker, who gives us our Week 10 report of Illini and the Pros. Thanks, Matt. Perfection continues in Kansas City. Offensive linemen Jeff Allen and John Osamoa helping tie a franchise record with the Chiefs' 9-0 start. They tallied 95 rushing yards in their 23-13 win over the Buffalo Bills, the ninth opponent they've held to 17 points or less. Up next, the Chiefs with their bye week. I don't think it's a bad time. Uh, I've got a mature bunch, and I think they'll handle it the the right way. They'll be tested the following week in the Sunday night matchup against the Denver Broncos. Turning our attention to the 6-2 and two Saints and running back Pierre Thomas. Thomas with seven catches for a season high 66 yards. A short grab here good for 26 yards. He also had six carries for 24 yards in the Saints 26-20 loss to the Jets. In another losing effort, Corey Legit and the San Diego Chargers lead it with three tackles as they fall in overtime to the Redskins. It's over! 30-24. And a heartbreaker for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Akeem Spence. Spence with two tackles, his fifth multi-tackle game of the season. It's the Seahawks, though, with the historic comeback 27-24.
And speaking of comebacks, the Colts with their own second half heroics, Vontae Davis had two tackles and helped pave the way for the 27-24 win. I'm Elise Menneker for Inside the Illini. Welcome back to Inside the Illini. Time to talk some FCS football. And what more can you say about Eastern Illinois? According to Matt Daniels, we could do an hour show on them, and we probably could. Seems like the first time in a while they didn't actually climb the FCS rankings, standing pat at measly number two in the country. Three games left in the OVC season. And for the forecast, as we do every week, we go to Eastern Illinois University for Inside the Panthers. The second-ranked Eastern Illinois Panthers welcomed Tennessee Tech to O'Brien Field last Saturday. EIU looked to stay atop the OVC, while Tennessee Tech was seeking their first win in the OVC this season. The high-flying Panthers hit their first half average for points by finding Pater four times in the first half. Senior wide receiver Eric Laura had a highlight reel day, scoring four times himself in the game as EIU jumped out to a 28-7 halftime lead. Here's the snap, Garoppolo back, stands in the pocket, guns it deep, middle, caught, touchdown, Eric Laura. Two more touchdowns put EIU up 42-7 midway through the third quarter, and then Laura scored for the fourth time on an 80-yard punt return, the longest punt return for a TD in school history, as the Panthers soared past the Golden Eagles, 56-21. 40, Laura in the clear at the 50, needs to beat the punter, around him at the 30, and he will score, and there's no flags this time, touchdown Eastern Illinois. The team came out and we played uh, our game. Uh, the coaches had a great game plan and, um, you know, there was holes in the defenses and we exploited them. We have a great quarterback who just puts the ball on the money and it makes my job easier. Jimmy Garoppolo maintained his spot as the front runner for the Walter Payton Award with a 399-yard passing day and four touchdown strikes. EIU head coach Dino Babers believes the sky is the limit for Jimmy football. I know how it is to have a quarterback that throws for 100 yards, that throws for 200 yards, or he barely gets to 300 and you're, and you're singing his praises. And now, you know, he has a day where he throws for 399 and everybody wants to say he had an off day. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo is special. And uh, we've got one home game left with him, two more away games, and then whatever happens, if we're fortunate enough to make the playoffs, whatever happens, happens. But uh, you need to come see him. You need to come see him. He's uh, an exciting football player. Next up for the Panthers is a matchup at Murray State. The Panthers and Racers held an epic shootout last year in Charleston with EIU winning in overtime 50-49. to We were sitting first in OVC, and, I mean, that's where we want to be. That's where we expected to be at the beginning of the season, I mean. One thing I'm really proud of the guys is we didn't let the hype at the beginning of the season get to us and you know we played through that and no one believed it. We didn't read all the articles and all that stuff and you know it's really paying off now and with three games to go I like where we're at and you know it's three tough games I mean we can't overlook anyone and we're just going to take it one game at a time. The Panthers have won eight of their last ten meetings against the Racers. EIU and Murray State square off today at 12 noon from Murray, Kentucky. The game can be viewed at the OVC Digital Network. Reporting on the Eastern Illinois Panthers for Inside the Illini, I'm Brad Kupiak of W. EIU. Thanks to EIU for that one. They get the middle of the OVC schedule over the next few weeks, and we'll be watching closely. Well, next up, our Pick'ems, brought to you by Hickory River Smokehouse. We will take a look at some of the big matchups across college football, make our picks, and we'll join that next on Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. Welcome back to Inside the Illini Big Ten Football, the fun part of the show where we get to talk about the, the matchups across the college football landscape, not just the Big Ten, and pick a couple of wild cards this week as well. We actually go way out west, my old uh, Pac-12 country. But we'll start in Big Ten country with uh, Penn State, Minnesota. As we flash up the standings for you, we'll get this conversation started. Penn State at Minnesota. Um, Matt, we'll get your thoughts on this one. Uh, I'm going with the Nittany Lions uh, to kind of pull a surprise. Uh, I think uh, Christian Hackenberg's going to have a great day, and Allen Robinson's going to uh, have another career day as well, and, and they'll come out of uh, Minneapolis with a win. We have our first disagreement. <laughs> I'm going to go with I the, did that purposely, I know. Steve. I'm going to go with a – you're setting me up, It creates you? better television. Yeah. So. You're setting me up. I'm going to go with the Golden Gophers at home. Um, I'm going to agree with Matt here. I, I, see Penn State becoming a little more balanced. I like what Belton did. Um, uh, Minnesota's running is its better part of its game, but Penn State's better at stopping it. So I just, overall, I like Penn State going on the road. I, I, 
don't know why I'm not willing to buy into Minnesota fully yet. I don't, maybe I'm an idiot for not doing that. Um, next up, we'll, we'll go to that West Coast game. UCLA at Arizona. Uh, the Bruins obviously had a loss there a couple weeks ago, but uh, taking on a, a hot and cold Arizona team. Yeah, good match of both, uh, both six and two teams, and right. uh, I think UCLA is going to come out uh, with a win in this one. We have our disagreement number two. <laughs> I'm going to go with the home team again. I'll go with the Wildcats of Arizona. Yeah, it's, it's hard to think after seeing where UCLA has been this year. Both teams are 6-2 and two and 3-2 and two in conference. Both of them literally have the same shot to go to the Pac-12 title game, and this one's in Arizona, which is why your pick is probably smart, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> uh, I, my pick is UCLA. Uh, Bruins have been so good all season. Um, one of those mirage records, I think. I think they're just a better team. All right, and finally, Kansas State at Texas Tech. We picked the Oklahoma State-Texas Tech game last week. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm going with Kansas State. I think Texas Tech is fading fast. Uh, they got off to a great start under Cliff Kingsbury, but uh, I just like the Wildcats in this one. We have disagreement number three. <laughs> I'm gonna go we see. planned this beforehand. No, I'm sticking with the home team. I'm either going to have a nice week or I'm going to fall further into the basement. So I'll go with Texas Tech. And I'm picking Texas Tech as well. I mean, they, they did ended up, you know, they fell way behind uh, to Oklahoma State. And ended up playing a pretty decent game there. They're at home, last home game of the season. It'll be senior day. I picked Texas Tech over Kansas State. All right, next is we when we go to Facebook and ask questions, and this one from Jeff, he asks, do you think this team truly believes they can still make a bowl game? The question isn't, do you think? Does this team believe they can win three of their next four? Uh, Illinois. Good, good, good question. Uh, they, they got some, uh, I mean, Ohio State comes to town next weekend, and then the Purdue game is obviously one I think Illinois fans are looking at as a possible win. Northwestern struggling, so... If they, you know, kind of uh, keep the offense clicking today and get enough stops on defense, uh, I, I think there's a chance. I don't think the uh, belief, the disbelief that they had last year and all the morale problems they had last year have, have flared up right now for this team. Uh, Nathan Shielow, Steve Hole, other seniors have really done a good job to try to keep guys' uh, guys' spirits up. And I'd say right now, going into today, they, they still have that, that reason that they can, you know, possibly go to a bowl game in December at all. I've been covering uh, college athletics for many years. I don't know that I ever know what a team really thinks. Yeah. Other than, and this is a cliche, you can't worry about winning three of the next four if you don't win the one that's today. Correct. So I do think they can, they think that they can win that game. Of course, Ohio State's another subject, but they're not even thinking about that now. So I, that wasn't much of an answer, I get that, <laughs> but I, I don't know what they're thinking. They're, you got to believe that they believe they can win this game. Well, my answer to the question is yes, because <laughs> if, if you go game by game, they think they can win today, and I think there's legitimacy in that. They might not think they can beat Ohio State, but they'll, they'll know that they can beat Purdue, and they'll think that they can beat Northwestern. So if they're going game by game, I think they could see the route to 3-1, and one, but of course the team that's lost 18 straight Big Ten games Win one before you win three of four, <laughs> exactly. I think, is the big argument there. Um, thank you, Jeff, for that question. Uh, on Facebook, go to our web, or go to our Facebook page. That's Inside the Illini on Facebook. Ask us a question. You could win a $25 gift card to Hickory River Smokehouse, which is where we're sitting right here. Well, next up, let's talk some Indiana. This could be a very intriguing matchup, and I think we're all excited for it. Second road game in a row, and all things considered, the last one didn't go too bad for Illinois. Happy Valley's a tough place to play. Uh, Good chance to break that Big Ten losing streak this week. That'll be one of the topics as we break down the game next on Inside the Alina Big Ten Football. Welcome back to Inside the Alina Big Ten Football, the final segment on the show. You know, we're just uh, about three and a half hours away from kickoff between Illinois and Indiana. Now, we're going to beat this topic to death, but Indiana is a team that scores a lot and gives up a lot. It's where the pieces fall in between that that will make this an intriguing matchup. We'll take a look at it right now. High scoring games in Bloomington aren't just a trend, they're a long term identity. In their eight games, the Hoosiers have yet to play one where the combined score was less than 50. Five of their games have score totals over 70, and two of them over 100. You know, spread, run it fast, and throw it around, and you know, they're playing explosive football right now. In terms of play calling, the offensive numbers are fairly balanced, just a handful more pass plays, but almost twice as many yards through the air. 
with a two-headed attack at QB. The Illini got a good dose of Nate Sudfeld on homecoming last year. In relief of their bench starter, Sudfeld completed 67% of his passes with a pair of touchdowns. At the time, it snapped the Big Ten's longest losing streak, a distinction that now belongs to Illinois. They're scoring a lot of points as they did last year. One of the top next two weeks is the offenses that we're playing are one and two. So uh, definitely a challenge for, for our defense. Trey Roberson adds an extra dimension, unafraid to use his running ability. But get this, in the last three weeks, Roberson has attempted 58 passes. Sudfeld has thrown 69 times. Who will be out there when is anybody's guess. Touchdown Hoosiers! But for every point they score, and you'll hear this storyline plenty, they give up nearly as many. 113th in the nation and last in the Big Ten in scoring defense. Worse even than 1-7 and seven Purdue. For us on, on our side of the ball, it's just making plays when those opportunities are there. Um, and, and you just got to be ready at, at all times. And like I said, we would beat the topic to death. Let's <laughs> talk about, first of all, let's talk about the good that comes from Indiana. Uh, their offense. They've been very efficient offense. Oh, yeah, and they operated a, a high tempo. Uh, Tim Banks, Illinois' defensive coordinator, said they kind of uh, pushed the pace almost like Washington did when Illinois played them earlier this year. And uh, Indiana will score points. Uh, the key thing, though, is will they stop anyone? It's almost like they're mirror images of each other. I said other. we're starting with the good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a very important topic to talk about. Yeah, no, they, they almost are mirror images of each other where the offenses can score uh, points in bunches and also give up points in bunches as well. I think it's encouraging for Illinois with how they were able to contain Penn State and um, it, it's just going to kind of, might, this might be a game that comes down to who has the ball last will win. Which means it's going to take all day to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be about a six hour football game today. Yeah, it doesn't start till 2.42 is the actual kick time and uh, it will take a while but uh, it's one of those games if you like offense should be fun. As soon as we say that, it's going to be a 17 to 10 yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. You know, field goal kickers that. are going to decide. Well, we did one. mention win being a factor, so I don't know if if uh, Coach Wilson or Coach Beckman care that it's going to affect how how much they can air the ball out. But the run games for uh, either team haven't been very effective. The this last year. time uh, Illinois won a Big Ten game was at Memorial Stadium in Bloomington, so maybe they can uh, go back and and uh, get that going again and start a different kind of streak. Talking about some of those offensive numbers, scoring like crazy, 10th in the country in points at 42 per game. They've got a nine game streak before they scored at least 28 points. Um, I'm sure there's a couple of games for Illinois that could have come in handy for them. Yeah, and I think it's uh, the key stat in that too with Indiana is they scored 28 points at Michigan State. Um, mm -hmm. I remember watching that, some of that game early and uh, Tevin Coleman, Indiana's running back, uh, he also splits some time with Houston, their other running back, but Tevin Coleman just burst through the line and had about a 70-yard touchdown run against Michigan State. And he's a, he's a burner and he's a, got that home run threat capability. Tim, Bank, Tim Banks mentioned that this week. So it's not just the passing game that Indiana has it too. The running game is effective at times and, and should be again against Illinois today. Speaking of that passing game, it's interesting it's week 10, and there's still kind of a quarterback battle going on in Bloomington. What do we know about their quarterback situation? Well, Trey Roberson got the start last week. He's listed uh, in the Orr situation first. Yeah. Roberson, Orr, Sudfeld. Sudfeld's stats are a lot better. He's passed for almost 2,000 yards mm -hmm. and 16 TDs. So I don't know what the, I'm, I'm just guessing uh, the Tim Banks uh, is right when he thinks he'll see them both, and they, you got to prepare for both of them. Yeah, I think both of them have seen a significant enough time the last few weeks that I think we should probably expect to see him both. Yeah, and Roberson's kind of that run threat too if they kind of run some zone read stuff with him. And he also has nine touchdown passes, so between the two of them, 25 touchdown passes, which is quite the impressive number, especially against a, a secondary of Illinois that uh, has not played well at times this year, to put it mildly. And you mentioned uh, Coleman, he's got 10 uh, rushing TDs. You think of Indiana as a passing team, but he's got almost 800 yards on the ground, so they've got a little more of a threat in that area than uh, does Illinois. Uh, Josh Ferguson, though, he's, he's there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about the, the other part of that, the Indiana's defense, which has had so many struggles stopping teams. They've given up 40 plus points five different times this year. Illinois should push the ball against Indiana, one of the more efficient offenses overall in the Big Ten. Yep, with Shewhouse having a pretty good year overall stat-wise, you know, he uh, he's not getting the wins that uh, you'd like to see him get, but he had a, a nice game last week, and he's getting it up and down the field. They just got to get it in the end zone when they get in the red zone. And avoid penalties. Avoid the touchdown <laughs> eliminating penalties. Yeah, yeah, two, so fresh. Two straight weeks, uh, Alex Hill, Illinois starting center, has had penalties on touchdowns right. that have called back. So. Uh, 
I asked him after Penn State if he felt snake bitten at all, and he said no, not really. Just kind of he's trying to make plays that, that aren't there, and uh, he takes full responsibility for for both those penalties that have happened in the last two weeks. That sure sounds like something Tim Beckman would say, doesn't it? Oh trying yeah, trying to make something happen that wasn't there. <laughs> yes, the, the he's been well plays. coached. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has. All right, well, it should be an interesting one to watch. Like I said, I mean. In my honest opinion, we haven't seen them win for so long. I need to see them win before I believe that they will. Part of me wants to believe that they will today, but uh, we'll check it out. We'll all be there with the coverage. Check out the coverage on the News Gazette, Sports Talk 1400, and of course, we'll have it on WAND TV. Follow us on Twitter for updates as well. Matt tweets like crazy. Unfollow me on Sundays, he says, because I'm just tweeting about my NFL team. Thanks for watching Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. Uh, enjoy the game and go Illini. Thank you for watching Inside the Illini, Big Ten College Football, brought to you by your local Anheuser-Busch distributors, O'Brien Auto Park of Urbana, Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana, and WAND.